The eustachian tube is very short, less than 4 cm, but you may need at least 4 full pages to write on eustachian tube. So the usually the auditory tube, other needs, otherwise called the auditory tube or the pharyngotympanic tube. Pharyngotympanic tube. Usually this is uh, asked in essay or in short note. So we can uh, discuss that under all these headings. <clears throat> and come to the uh, function of eustachian tube. Before that, in normally a resting phase, is this eustachian tube uh, open or closed? I am sure some of you are in doubt. Remember, the eustachian tube is closed. It is closed at life, closed during life, during resting phase, and in your yawning or uh, swallowing or forceful inspiration. Uh, inflation it opens so usually it is closed first functions of the eustachian tube there are three functions of eustachian tube this is the eustachian tube bony part and the cartilaginous part so uh, the first one when it open the pressure uh, air goes from the nasopharynx into the eustachian tube then the uh, first one is that is uh, ventilation of the middle ear It ventilates or pressure regulation. Second one, protection. It's the protection of the middle ear from nasopharyngeal secretions and sound pressure. And the third function is clearance of drainage uh, or drainage of middle ear secretions into the nasopharynx. Okay, so drainage of secretions. So, of the function, it ventilates or pressure, uh, regulates the pressure within the middle ear. Protection of the middle ear from the nasopharyngeal secretions and sound pressure. And third, drainage of middle ear or clearance of middle ear secretions into the nasopharynx. Mucociliary action is towards the nasopharynx. So, the secretions or the mucous secretions from the middle ear will go into the um, nasopharynx. The development it is from the tubotimanic recess. If you want to know in detail, go to the earlier classes of development of uh, ear, nose and throat. So, the development is from the tubotimanic recess. Okay. Of the anatomy, this eustachian tube is total 36 millimeter long tube. It has got a bony part and a cartilaginous part. This is bony. This part is bony. Okay, this part is bony. And this part is cartilaginous. Okay, so it has got a bony part and a cartilaginous part. Of this bony part, this bony part is 12 millimeters. It is a 12 millimeter long uh, tube opening to the anterior wall of the middle ear. So arising from the anterior wall of middle ear and it passes through squamous and uh, petrous part of temporal bone. Here both squamous and petrous part of temporal bone and it comes and joins the cartilaginous tube, uh, portion at an isthmus. And this isthmus is the narrowest part of the uh, eustachian tube which is around 2 mm in uh, diameter. So, this uh, um, body part 12 mm arising from the anterior wall of the middle ear and it passes through squamous and petrous part of temporal bone, comes and joins with the cartilaginous uh, tube at the isthmus which is the narrowest part and this part if you take the cross section it will be almost uh, rectangle it will be almost the shape of a rectangle in cross section and above that there will be a 
tense uh, tympani muscle. Okay, so superiorly of the uh, it is separated from the tense tympani muscle by a thin uh, plate of bone, and also in the medial part there will be internal carotid artery. Okay, this is the internal carotid artery. So above there will be tense tympani tendon and medially. This uh, bony part of cartilaginous, uh, bony part of eustachian tube is separated from the internal carotid artery by a thin plate of bone. Will be cartilaginous, this part. And this, this is the cross section of the bony part. It will be either triangle or uh, rectangle in cross section. And of the cartilaginous part, this cartilage is seen on the, uh, if this is the If this is a eustachian tube, this cartilage is seen on the posteromedial surface, and it uh, hang hang over to the superior part like a hood, okay, or a flange. Okay, so this is cartilage is seen on the posteromedial aspect and it goes over the uh, upper part like a flange and this um, androlateral part there is no cartilage. So this is around 24 millimeter. It starts from the isthmus and the medial end is to the uh, lateral wall of nasopharynx. It is around, uh, this, this part will be in the nasopharynx. So this uh, if you draw the postnasal uh, appearance, postnasal uh, is a ula, is open here. Okay. This is your uh, superior. These are your turbinates and the eustachian tube opens into the 1.5, uh, 1 to 1.25 centimeters. It is not millimeter to, behind the posterior end of the inferior turbinate. Below and behind the mid, uh, posterior end of the inferior turbinate. This is the inferior turbinate. Okay, this is the inferior turbinate. So, it, this is the opening and at the opening this cartilage lies directly below the mucous membrane. So what happens? It forms an elevation there and that elevation is called the tubal elevation, torus tubaris. It's called the torus tubaris. Okay. Uh, torus tubaris is a Elevation of the elevation formed by the cartilage, uh, cartilaginous part of the uh, eustachian tube, and around this uh, torus tubaris there are lymphoid tissue seen mainly in pediatric group, and it is called the tubal tonsils. This is lymphoid enlargement is more prominent in children, and behind the torus tubaris, behind the tubal elevation, so it is usually seen as a Elevation. If you see, look from uh, anterior or uh, from front, you see an elevation. This is seen as an elevation or tu uh, uh, tubal elevation. And behind the tubal elevation, there is a uh, depression or a pouch called fossa of Rosenmuller. So this force of Rosenmuller is seen as a, <clears throat> a depression or an invagination. Whatever you say, it's a um, fossa seen behind the torus tubaris. And this fossa of Rosenmuller is important because it is a common site of origin of an esophageal malignancy as well as primary occult tumors. Fossa of Rosenmuller. So uh, this uh, eustachian tube is a 36 millimeter uh, long tube having a 
bony part and a cartilaginous part and the bony part is from arises from the anterior wall of the uh, middle ear and it passes through the squamous and vitreous part of temporal bone and it comes and attaches at the cartilaginous part by an isthmus which is the narrowest part of the eustachian tube and cartilaginous part starts from the isthmus and it uh, runs downwards forwards and medially and comes to the nasopharynx lateral wall and opens 1 to 1.25 cm below and behind the posterior end of the inferior terminate and uh, this opening cartilage is seen on the posteromedial surface and it forms an elevation over the mucosa and it is called the torus tubaris and the tubal tonsil is more prominently seen in children and behind the tubal elevation there is a fossa of Rosenmuller which is a common site of um, nasopharyngeal malignancy and also primary occult tumors and this cartilaginous part runs in a is fixed to the skull base and it runs in a groove formed by the greater wing of sphenoid and petrous part of temporal bone here it is in the skull base and there is a groove formed by greater wing of sphenoid and petrous part of temporal bone if this runs in the groove and it's limited medially by the root of the medial pterygoid plate okay you must have noticed the higher incidence of ear infections in children that is because there are some difference between adult and uh, pediatric eustachian tube this eustachian tube in adult you have can see this is the uh, bony part and this is the cartilaginous part this is in adult but in children it is shorter and wider and it is more horizontal okay It is uh, in pediatric age group or in infants and in children this is shorter, wider and more horizontal than in adult and there is no angulation at the bony cartilaginous junction. See, bony cartilaginous junction there is no angulation and another difference it is shorter, wider and uh, no angulation it is more of horizontal. without any angulation at the bony cartilaginous uh, junction and this cartilage is flaccid cartilage is and on the cartilage it is flaccid with the less of elastic so what happens because of it is flaccid this reflex occurs more easily from the nasopharynx and even the milk can come during feeding the milk can go to the uh, a middle ear and also because it's less elastic the uh, recoiling will not be proper and so the eustachian tube closing will not be proper so that is why the children get more of ear infection than in adult so that is a, this difference in pediatric and adult is important it will be usually asked as short note or an, a viva also it is asked so it is shorter wider and more horizontal and there is no angulation in the bony cartilaginous uh, uh, junction and this uh, cartilage is more uh, uh, flaccid and less of elastic that allows more uh, reflex recoil a uh, reflex of nasopharyngeal secretion and uh, there is less recoiling of the cartilage and what is this Osman's fat pad this this thing what is it it is here this reddish mark it is the Osman's fat pad it is a fat pad seen on the androlateral surface of the eustachian, the cartilaginous part of the eustachian tube. This uh, help in keeping the eustachian tube, this part, this help in keeping the eustachian tube closed and it also prevents the uh, nasopharyngeal secretion entering into the eustachian tube. This is it, seen on the androlateral surface of the uh, cartilaginous part of the eustachian tube and help in keeping the eustachian tube closed. So that the next one, supply. The nerve supply, uh, it has got a sensory part and a motor part. 
the sensory supply is from uh, of the nerves the sensory is from the uh, Jacobson's nerve that is uh, usage uh, tympanic branch of closer pharyngeal ninth nerve so that is the Jacobson's nerve and the motor supply to the muscles mainly uh, one is tensor parity supplied by the mandibular mandibular supplies the tensor parity and also the uh, pharyngeal plexus so one is through mandibular nerve and another from the pharyngeal plexus to cranial accessory through vagus nerve so tenth nerve accessory cranial accessory supplies the uh, this is mandibular supplies the tensor parity and this supplies the levator parity and the salpingo parities the blood supply is from three artery middle meningeal artery ascending pharyngeal artery and artery of pterygoid canal and the uh, venous drainage into the uh, pharyngeal plexus and the lymph node is the retropharyngeal lymph node. Lymph lymphatic drainage is first drainage into the retropharyngeal lymph nodes. And next coming to the muscles. Mainly there are three muscles. The tensor vale palatini, levator vale palatini and salpindo pharynges. Along with the tensor tympani. Tensor tympani we have uh, discussed along with the contents of the middle ear. And all these muscles are the openers of the eustachian tube. And the first one, we can talk about the tensor vale palatini. It has got uh, origin, is from the spinosphenoid. So this tensor palatini origin from one from the spinosphenoid. Three origin. Spinosphenoid. Second one, scaphoid fossa. Second is from the bony part of the scaphoid fossa. And third, I have already told this is a cartilaginous part and this cartilage, uh, cart, uh, this cartilage of the uh, cartilaginous illustration tube mainly on the postero uh, medial surface and from there it acts as a flange. It comes as a flange to the front surface. So this tensor palatine originates from this flange. So it has got three origin. One is from the spinosphenoid, then from the bony wall of the scaphoid fossa, and from this cartilaginous flange over the upper portion of the cartilaginous eustachian tube. Uh, it descends uh, downwards as a single tendon. Then it comes downwards and uh, it hooks around the pterygoid hamulus. <coughs> okay. And then uh, it hooks around the pterygoid hamulus. What is pterygoid hamulus? It is a bony projection from the lower end of the medial pterygoid plate of the spinoid board. So it comes, descends as a single tendon, hooks around the pterygoid hamulus and then it comes to a soft palate and it flares out and joins with the opposite side at the midline raphe. Okay, so that is tensor villae palatini, originating from the spinosphenoid, the bony, the whole length of the bony wall of the, the scaphoid fossa and from the flange of the cartilage from the cartilaginous part of eustachian tube, descends downward as a single tendon, hooks around the pterygoid hamulus and then fans out, comes to a soft palate and fans out and joins with the tendon of the opposite side. This mainly, this is a main opener of the eustachian tube and supplied by the mandibular nerve. So that is about tensor vale palatini. This levator vale palatini has got two origin. One is from the lower surface of cartilaginous part of the eustachian tube. 
and second is from the lower surface of the petrous bone. At first it is inferior to the eustachian tube, then it crosses to the medial side and merges with the soft palate. Okay. And this salpingopharyngeus is a weaker muscle which is seen around the uh, opening, pharyngeal opening of the uh, cartilaginous eustachian tube and it merges with the palatopharyngeus. So, this salpingopharyngeus and levator vena palatia are supplied by the pharyngeal plexus through cranial accessory of vagus nerve and tensor palate is by the mandibular nerve. And all the three are the openers of the eustachian tube. This one is test of tubal function and patency. This function and patency are uh, different actually. So in function, we know it is a mucociliary clearance comes first and patency is an open eustachian tube. It's a patent eustachian tube or not. Any, if you are looking for patency, we can uh, know that there is no mechanical obstruction or obstruction of the tube. And uh, in function, any damage to the mucociliary action can cause a dysfunct uh, dysfunction of the eustachian tube. So patency, the main tester, valsalva maneuver, friends, toy and polyxalization and uh, eustachian tube catheterization. <coughs> Coming to the valsalva maneuver, it is a clinical test, you can do that in uh, outpatient unit. We are increasing the intrathoracic pressure by closing the nostril and the mouth, ask the patient to blow. See, so we have to develop a pressure of 33 millimeters of mercury in order to open the eustachian tube. So the eustachian tube open, air enters and your tympanic membrane will bulge out. That is valsalva. But the disadvantage is that it is very simple, very easy to do. But the disadvantage is that in cases of, uh, if the patient cannot build an intrathoracic pressure, like in a case of a tracheostomy patient, this cannot be done. But in that case, we can do a Frenzel maneuver. Frenzel maneuver is, we are uh, closing the nostril and the glottis and elevating the uh, floor of mouth and the tongue. There is no need to close the nostril also. Do like this. Just closing the uh, glottis and the nostril and elevating the muscles of the floor of mouth and the tongue so that again there is a pressure is built up and we need only 8 millimeters of mercury pressure to open the eustachian tube. Again the air will come and will bulge the eustachian uh, tympanic membrane. So the uh, advantage of Frenzel maneuver is that it can be done at any phase of respiration and it is independent of the intrathoracic pressure. <clears throat> but the disadvantage is that we have to train the patient. Okay. So that is Frenzel and Toynbee test. Just Close into your nostril and ask the patient to swallow. Okay, swallow. So then what happens? A negative pressure is formed here and the tympanic membrane will bulge, move inwards. In toy B, the tympanic membrane will move inwards. And polyxalization <coughs> and eustachian catheterization uh, also done for patency testing. These are not at all, uh, not much done uh, nowadays. Okay, it's rarely performed test. And uh, find out what is the, whether the tympanic membrane is normal. Look for the normal appearance of tympanic membrane, also for the normal mobility. A retracted tympanic membrane signify, uh, shows that the, there is eustachian tube dysfunction. Retracted tympanic membrane is the hallmark of an eustachian tube dysfunction, right? So, pneumatic otoscope, you can see here. And if you want to see the nasopharyngeal opening of the eustachian tube go for a nasopharyngoscopy nasopharyngoscope go scope okay nasopharyngoscope along with that we go for a phototubometry also we can do photo Geometry. Through this, a flexible nasopharyngoscope is preferred. Through this, we can see the nasopharyngeal opening of the eustachian tube. Okay. And 
another one is a tympanometry. It is through uh, um, impedance audiogram. We get a in tympanometry. Normally, pressure against complaints, we get an A curve. A curve is normal. But in case of eustachian tube dysfunction, it will be C curve. Note the ciliary dysfunction. There are two tests. Ciliary action, we go for a dye test and saccharin test, saccharin. Okay, so dye test and saccharin test, this is uh, mainly for the perforated tympanic membrane and to find out whether eustachian tube function is normal, that ciliary action is normal or not. So the dye that is the methylene blue, is it instilled into the middle ear? Through, if there is a perforation, this is instilled into the middle ear and with the nasopharyngoscope, we, um, we look for the color of methylene blue at the uh, uh, eustachian opening in the nasopharynx. That is dye test and saccharin test, same. If you are instilling into the middle ear through a perforation and after some time, you can feel the taste of saccharin in the mouth. If it is... Uh, Normally getting a taste and a, uh, seeing, is a normally seeing the color of the dye, that means that the ciliary action is normal. So, regarding the eustachian tube, we talked about the function. There are three functions, protection, ventilation and clearance of secretions. Development is from the tubotomeric vessels. Anatomy again. There is a bony part and a uh, cartilaginous part and difference between adult and pediatric uh, eustachian tube. Osman's fat, of, fat pad, it's a, a pad of fat on the androlateral or the inferior, uh, inf inferolateral part of the uh, eustachian tube aiding in keeping the eustachian tube closed. Now and blood supply, the muscles, mainly the tensor palliative, levator palliative and salpingopharynges along with tensor tympani and uh, the test of tubal function and patency of that. The simple test of valsalva and the more uh, uh, trained but advantageous one is the uh, Frenzel maneuver, toy and eustachian catheterization along with the otoscopy, pneumatic otoscopy, nasopharyngoscopy with photo uh, tubometry timerometry and imaging techniques and for finding out the ciliary function there are two tests they are the dye test and the saccharin test